Hello and welcome back. This is Dr. Christopher Gennari. This is the Great Big History Podcast. And in this episode, this is our third and last episode on China. And in this episode, we do the Qin and Han dynasties. The Qin dynasty is from 221 to 206 and is the not the first dynasty, but it is the first unification of China as an empire under an emperor. And you notice it's fairly late. It's about the time of the Roman Republic. So China's been a while, been along, uh, not China. Egypt has existed for some 3,000 years by this point. India has a Bronze Age. They're at least 2,000 years old. China has a Bronze Age too. And China has a succession of uh, powerful dynasties and families that have come through. So, but the first modern political system in China that we're really talking about that it's different. That's not tribal elites or chiefs or some decentralized system it really is the Qin. The Qin is something different. But you'll also notice they only last 15 years. This is not successful. 15 years is not a successful dynasty. Dynasties are supposed to last a couple hundred years because it's a family. You notice the Qin is one person. And so, as I mentioned, this the Qin is the first emperor. Not a tribal chief, not a decentralized state. This is the first time China gets one guy in charge of it who says, I'm in charge. I'm running the show. I'm in charge of everything. And the Qin is kind of China's bad boyfriend. Is a way to think about it. Because the Qin doesn't really like China all that much for being the first emperor. This is not a love affair. This is an abusive relationship. The first thing that the Qin do is want China to destroy all evidence that it had a past. Oh, by the way, these this is the emperor of the of the Terracotta warrior uh army. So you could see just how like kind of nuts this this is, how obsessed with displays of power this guy is. And this is, the, I call him the China's bad boyfriend because he wants to destroy the past. He's jealous that China existed before him. And so the argument is nothing existed before I showed up. Everything that existed was bad. And I'm going to get rid of all evidence that it was there. Because if there's no evidence, then it starts with me. Uh, this is George Orwell in 1984. He who controls the past controls the future and he who controls the present controls the past it's the idea that you can make you can destroy the past and now you can change how people think about the present and the future so he wants to burn the past and that includes sun Tzu stuff that includes confucius stuff that includes a whole lot of like that's about two thousand years of chinese development the third thing he does is massive public works. Now, we've seen this before. The Romans will do it. Egypt does it. Lots of people do massive public works. And it works. People like massive public works. People liked building pyramids. People liked building Diocletian's baths and then using them. But the Qin are different. Why? Because they use slave labor. Unlike the Egyptians and unlike the Romans. And the idea here was... Look at what I can make you do. I can bring you out to the edges of the empire and make you war work for free on a giant wall. I can look at what I can make you do. So this is abusive. And people don't like it because they're being made to do this. Even the making of big things, the terracotta warriors, the, the start of the Great Wall, these various different big things were still ways like the Assyrians used to dominate people, to show I'm in charge of you. So this guy died, the emperor died, and it set off a revolution of the nobility who were tired, who were sick to death of this. So we went from a warring states to a one centralized emperor, and then we go back to a warring states. There's a revolution of the people and the nobility against this. It is a complete failure of political success, of creating a new system. 
And what we get is the Han. Now the Han, H-A-N, is what is the boyfriend you marry. How do I know that? Well, Chinese civilization is called Han civilization today. They're the same. The largest ethnic group in China, 85% of the people, is Han Chinese. So Han, H-A-N, becomes the people, and the people become the dynasty. So that's the one you marry. It's the longest lasting one. It lasts 400 years from 206 BC to 220 AD. Uh, it's much bigger than the Qin. It will go south of the Yangtze River and push up to the jungles and the mountains in Vietnam and Laos. It will also go into Korea. And most importantly, it will head west into Central Asia. So it's the anti-chin. Why? Well, if you've ever been in a terrible relationship with a terrible person, you want the next person to not be so terrible. In fact, you might want the next person to be the opposite. And that's what the Han are. The Han's arguments. Now, remember, all of this happened in a year. The emperor died. The system collapsed. China broke into a warring states. And then the Han took over all within a year. So China was willing to keep an emperor. And it, it just wanted a good emperor, and it was willing. The Qin were so bad, they were willing to take anybody. If anybody could win, they went, all right, we're in charge. And everyone went, okay, fine, great. They didn't want, they didn't, they were too exhausted to go into hundreds of years of warfare to try to figure out who the right family is. They just wanted somebody who wasn't the Qin. And so the Han are the anti Qin. Now, if the Qin are all about selfishness, the Han are going to be anti selfishness. Is there a philosophy out there about anti-selfishness, maybe responsibilities and obligations to each other, mutual respect? Yes, and that is Confucianism. And Han China is going to use Confucianism to replace the Qin selfishness. The Qin are not Confucian at all. They, in fact, try to destroy Confucianism, Confucian thought, Confucian writings, because being Confucian is to not think the Qin are the greatest thing in the whole wide world. It's to, it's to argue that everybody has obligations to each other, the powerful to the poor. Whereas the Han are like, no, we like this. We have obligations to you. You have obligations to us. We're all going to get along. And so the Han use Confucianism to create that connection between the people and the dynasty. So how? How do they do this? Well, the first is to protect people. Remember all those nomadic barbarians in the north and the west? We're going to beat those people up. In fact, the most famous people they're going to beat up is the Huns, H-U-N-S. And they're going to kick them out of western China. And they're going to go barreling across Central Asia. And instead of hanging a left and going into the Middle East and destroying the Parthians or the Sassanid Persians, they keep on going straight across Russia, burning their way across Europe into western Europe where they hit the Goths and the Germans who freak out, burst into the Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire is destroyed by the combination of these mass migrations of Goths, Germans, and Huns. So the first made in China was ultimately 200 years later, the destruction of Rome. Great. Thank you. So they're going to push out dangerous peoples, and they're going to control the trade routes. The, the Han are going to organize trade. They're going to build trade routes. They're going to build those highways in order that people will make money. So there's our connection. We're going to help you have a better life. We're going to protect you so you're safe and we're going to help you make money. So that's Confucian. The fourth is the Silk Road. How are you going to make money? Well, we're going to connect you to the outside world because it's one thing to sell stuff to other Chinese people, but that money is just going in circles. It's going from your pocket to my pocket to someone else's pocket, back to your pocket, back to my pocket. That money is not increasing. It's circular. So you need to get money from outside the system to increase the system. And that's the Silk Road. China is not connected to the rest, of the, rest of the rest of the civilized world. And so what it wants to do is connect. And so what it does is it sets up this system. Now, Silk Road sounds like it's a road, but it's not. It's a series of rest stops along Central Asia that will be protected from nomads. Remember, the nomads are out there. And this, this road, this system is going to go right through them. It's going to go right through the nomadic world. 
and start carving up kind of like how the, the Union Pacific Railroad, the Transcontinental Railroad, cut right through Indian country and was this little piece of American civilization in the middle of Indian territory, Indian nation land. And from there, it just spreads out and pushes the Native Americans, the indigenous peoples out and swallows up their land. The Silk Road does much the same thing. It cuts right through and every city along the way is going to be wealthy. Why? Because nobody goes to full length. Nobody does a Marco Polo. That's crazy. It's 8,000 miles long. It's going to take you 10 years to do it. So what they do is they go one, maybe two rest stops. They're a day or two away. Nobody wants to camp out in the middle of the, the high desert. They no one wants to camp out in Central Asia because there's nomads out there who will kill you and take your stuff. And so these towns are about a day apart from each other. And so you go to a town and you have your goods, you have your cart, you have your goods. And so you sell them and then you buy goods and you go home. And the guy who you sell them to goes the other way, goes west one town and sells those goods to people who go another town west. And so it's by osmosis stuff from China eventually gets to the Middle East and Europe. Now, these are going to be spices. These are going to be dry goods, as Americans would say. They're things that don't go bad. Silk is the big one. That's why it's called the Silk Road. Um, but also spices, things that Europe doesn't have. And the Middle East doesn't have. And so you get this osmosis of goods moving from west, from east to west and money moving slowly from west to east. And that allows China to dominate global trade. China from this point until the industrial revolution is going to be the largest trading country on earth, more or less. The only thing that gets in its way is when you have warring states, the collapse of a dynasty might interrupt that that Silk Road period for a while, but at least until the coming of the destruction of the Silk Road by Tamerlane and the Mongolian civil wars, uh, the end of Marco Polo, till at least 1400 AD, China is the biggest merchant in the world. It is constantly selling goods. It is the do It dominates global trade. It makes more money off of trade than any other empire, any other civilization. So what happens to this? And remember, this is Confucian, right? The Silk Road is Confucian because it's saying to its people, we will put in the system that you can make money. You will have a better life. Give us power and we'll create a system where you will have a better life. And people said, okay, that's cool. So what happens? Well, the Han end up with a series of child emperors. And that's fine. They happen. The empires and kingdoms are built for that. Children happen. And so you have a regency. Now you get a problem if you have multiple child emperors in a, in a, in a row, which means you had an adult, had a child, died. That child is then given to a regency, R-E-G-E-N-C-Y, which is a bunch of adults, uh, usually in the same family. So they have, they have the desire to keep things kind of steady. Right. No major changes. But at the same time, they each have their own particular wants and needs that conflict with each other. And so basically what happens in a regency is nothing. Basically, everybody agrees nothing's going to happen because if someone says, oh, what I really want to do is raise taxes on pool supplies. Well, the cousin that's in charge in part of the regency who owns the largest pool supply corporation is going to object to that. And now you're going to have a fight. And then it's the worry is that that makes the, the government so weak that other noble families might take over. So you keep the United front by basically getting nothing done. Okay. Well, that's 20 years or so. Then the child becomes an adult. And the idea is once the child becomes the adult, he'll be a 25 year old, 20 to 25 year old adult. He can run the system. He'll be in charge of the system for 20, 30, 40 years. And so that child, once they become an adult, once they become a full emperor, will fix all the problems, make the decisions, get things done. Well, what if that child dies? 
Now, the first thing that child is going to do is once it becomes an adult, so it becomes 18, is going to get married, right? Because you have to have children. So turns 18, gets married, has a child, two years pass, starting to fix some problems and dies. Well, now you have another two-year-old. So you have another regency. And then that child becomes an adult, gets married, has a child, and then that child dies. That adult dies. Now you have another regency. And you can see now problems that had been small problems at year one of the first regency are now 60 years later going to be big problems because they're going to compound. That bridge that needed fixing but was usable in year one of our first regency by the last year of our third regency, year 60, is, has already fallen into the river. It's gone. It's a problem. And so having a series of child emperors means nothing gets done for the better part of a century. Which is fine, as long as nothing bad happens. Well, guess what happens? Something bad happens. A death cult pops up. A religious revolution happens of an apocalyptic war cult. If you've ever played Dynasty Warriors or um, as a game, this is the Yellow Turban. These are people who want to destroy the government in order to create the apocalypse and bring God down on Earth to blow up the universe so that you could go so that the true believers can go to heaven. You might think that's crazy, but there's plenty of people in America who think this, too. Who are, they're just waiting for the apocalypse. They're kind of upset it hasn't happened yet. And so, even if you're a weak emperor, a weak child emperor, you can't allow, even a weak regency can't allow a death cult to destroy the universe. So, what do they do? They hire powerful generals. And those powerful generals raise private armies. Because the, the emperor can't have an army. The emperor is a six-year-old. And those private generals raise their private armies, and they go and fight the death cult. And they win. They defeat the death cult. And then they look at the six-year-old emperor and go, yeah, that's not going to work. And then they look at each other and say, uh, I'm not listening to you. And what they basically do is take their armies and do what Alexander's generals did, is break up the empire, is decide, go to their armies and say, I'll make you rich if you fight for me. And the army, of course, says, great, you're awesome. Let's fight. And so they divide up China into their own private states. They become warlords. So this becomes the, the romance of the three kingdoms, one of the first novels ever written. The idea is eventually those like 15 states or 26 states or so become three big ones that keep fighting for the next couple hundred years. And they'll have heroes and they'll have villains and this Cow Cow. Now, Cow Cow was the general in chief who kind of caused the collapse of the Han because he says, Oh, what I'll do is I'll marry my daughter to the emperor. Since I'm general in chief, I'm like the best servant. So I'll marry my daughter to the emperor, thus making me the uncle to the emperor. And I'll be made general of all the armies. I'll be in charge. And basically, I'll be in charge of the regency. And I'll take over. So for 20 years, I'll be the emperor. And that was his plan. And of course, the other nobility, other nobility said, no, we're not going to put up with you. I've known you for 20 years. You're a jerk. I'm not going to listen to you. And so what you got was the breakup of war. As different sides fought different groups, trying to, some trying to put the emperor, free the emperor from Cao Cao, others trying to destroy the emperor, others trying to make their own countries and then other invade other people to remake China in their name. And so you get the collapse of the Han in the 200s. Uh, it's a self-inflicted wound. It is not, surprisingly, brought about by an invasion by nomads. Um, this will eventually lead to the Tang, T-A-N-G, a bunch of military. Eventually, you get the rise of a military family, the Tang, who will uh, overwhelm all the other warring states and unify um, China and recreate the Silk Road, reopen the Silk Road. And because you could see with the collapse, you have the with the collapse of authority, there's the collapse of the Silk Road because there's no longer these large armies protecting all those places from nomads along the way. 
And so that's the end of the Han. Um, this is the end of our China chapter. So thank you. Take care. Bye.